Welcome. We're going to get started with this panel where we're talking about the workforce in the optometric profession, the changing demographics, and what some of those impacts are and, and what that means. We've got a fabulous panel with us, uh, Dr. Stacy Lyons from New England College of Optometry, Dr. Ray Corbin-Simon from Piscataway, New Jersey, where she has a private practice, and she's also a consultant with the Power Practice, and Dr. Diane Russo from New England College of Optometry also. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So the percentage of women is, is going up, and, and even before I say that, this, the information that we're presenting here will be available to you in this, in this download and um, that, that you've been sent and uh, that will include again. What we've seen is an increase in the percentage of women practicing. It's up to about 44% now nationwide. And that's surprising to a lot of people because the percentage of women in colleges has been significantly higher than that. But creating that to shift into the into the actual profession is, is taking a little bit longer. Um, Dr. Lyons, you've, you've certainly seen it in schools. Absolutely. Um, when you look at gender trends, um, the ASCO data reports um, that the entering class, for example, of 2019-2020, approximately 70% of students are women. At the New England College of Optometry, gender trends are slightly higher than the aggregate of the ASCO data in that in the late 1990s, um, NECO's class grew to about 50-50 at that particular point and steadily continued to grow in that the entering class of 2024, this year's class that entered yesterday, uh, is 79% women. Dr. Russo, the same kind of thing is happening in uh, in the academic, in the faculty uh, scene. Right, yes. Yeah. So we're seeing similar trends. Um, the, the percentages aren't quite as high as we're seeing among the student population. But if you look at um, some of the ASCO data going back to even say about 2007, if we look at the data for um, full-time male faculty members, the numbers are fairly flat. Um, compared to the, the number of full-time female faculty members, which has been steadily on the rise. Uh, the most recent ASCO numbers that I saw was that the, um, num the percentage of female faculty members uh, across all schools uh, in the aggregate is about 58%. Um, so just as we're seeing that increasing trend in females uh, in the student population, um, that's being at least somewhat mirrored in the faculty population as well. And Dr. Corbin Simon, what about in the uh, uh, the population of of working ODs? What are you seeing from the consultancy kind of perspective? I think where we're at right now, we're about fifty fifty actually, um, males to females. But what we're noticing though is that there are more females that are um, and you know looking for consultants um, more people more um, female doctors are trying to find consultants and I think part of that too is just that work-life balance that they're reaching for um, that may explain too why you see that percentage number actually decreasing and not as many female ODs out there practicing. Interesting so increasing numbers unfortunately don't equal parity don't don't bring us to, to parity um and and one of the ways that we know that is we've we've all taken a look at the 2020 jobs and optical research numbers that show that women are earning less than men this is uh the the 2020 report which is 2019 compensation data so this is this is all pre-covid but um even even so com compared to the year the report the year before average income for, for ODs has gone up uh, between 2018 and 2019. However, the discrepancy between what women are reporting as their compensation is considerable. Um, among full-time ODs, men uh, reported an average income of nearly $198,000 and women reported an average income of $130,000. Um, 
Dr. Lyons, the 2019 report that uh, Jobson, the report that we published in 2019 got your attention. Can you, can you tell us why? It did, and, and I was reflecting back about this. Um, you know, I was catching up on emails and saw the women in optometry email and started reading the report of compensation data um, last year. And the data to me was, is absolutely staggering. And I think I called you immediately at that point. I then started to read many studies about gender pay inequities in other medical professions, knowing that this issue is really not unique to optometry. And it's so important to me uh, that as a profession, we grab the opportunity now and start working towards potential solutions that will address or chip away at the gender equity gap. Um, Last year, the AMA passed their principles in advancing gender equity in medicine. And it really discusses many ways that medicine is looking to approach gender equity issues. And as a profession, optometry, we need to consider doing the same. Um, so we got together with um, our president, Howard Purcell, to start discussing what we can do as a college and a profession in this area. So I really need to thank Howard uh, for supporting us in all of these endeavors. And you pulled Dr. Russo in. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, so uh, we, we tend to discuss uh, quite an array of topics uh, within the profession. And this is something that we've talked about even prior to um, the, the Women in Optometry report coming out last year. And so this was um, a great opportunity for um, Dr. Lyons and I to collaborate together with several of our other colleagues, and then also to have this nice com uh, collaboration between academia and industry, um, and which you know doesn't necessarily happen as commonly as it could. And so, especially with the support of um, Dr. Purcell, we, we thought we'd seize the, the opportunity. And, and really what we wanted to do was take a deeper dive uh, to get more meaningful and useful data that can be used for practicing ODs and for our students who will eventually become graduates. And in, in looking at the data, so we have some of the aggregate data that you were just mentioning, Marjolyn, but we'll also be looking at um, additional variables like uh, the number of years in practice, the mode of practice that someone is in, whether or not they're an owner versus an employee to really try and make sure that we're comparing apples to apples so that we're getting a, a very clear picture of the gender pay gap that exists um, to try and tease out the extent to which it exists. Right. One of the things that the Jobson data shows is that younger ODs or those who are, you know, five or so years out of school have the smallest pay gap. There is still a pay gap, but it's it, those women ODs are reporting that they're earning roughly 90% of what their male colleagues are earning. Yet the further uh, the, the more experience they have, um, the bigger the gap grows. Uh, um, Dr. Corbin Simon, does this resonate with you from a from a consultancy standpoint? I mean, what what are you seeing? I think most of the doctors that we deal with are actually private practice ODs, right? So, in terms of setting their own salaries. Um, I think one of the things that we notice, um, you have you have female ODs, when we talk about the fact that they can earn more money, there's always um, a little bit of, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I can I can offer it to someone else, I can offer it to my staff members. Whereas you deal with, with the males um, ODs when you're doing the consultant, um, that's not the case. So um, it, it's just an, an, an interesting in terms of the discrepancy. I do find though, when it comes to the younger ODs, because many of the students are graduating, they're more in debt. 
these days, they're a little bit more aggressive in terms of making sure that they're earning their salary where they can actually make a living because of their student debt. So I think that's a big driving force um, compared to, you know, our older counterparts who are um, in, has been in practice for several years, and they're not used to, you know, really negotiating um, because that's, a, that's one of the biggest things you notice when you're a consultant. They're not used to that. They're not used to the negotiations and they want to take a step back from that. And, you know, I'm fine. I'm comfortable. I like to stay where I'm at. So, but the younger ODs, it's a little bit different um, when you're dealing with them because they're a little bit more aggressive and saying, okay, well, I've, I've, I've earned this. Okay, and I don't want to be in debt, you know, for the rest of my life, so. That's interesting because we're going to have a panel tomorrow on um, uh, negotiation strategies, but this, this can't all be on this can't be the responsibility of every individual OD, right? It, it can't be, hey, uh, you got to negotiate harder, you know? <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Lyons, you're nodding. What, uh, yeah. It's not just a women issue. Mm -hmm. It's a profession issue. Mm -hmm. So important that, yes, we teach um, the, the employment seeking skills um, to prep new ODs of going into practice, um, and something I do when I mentor all the time, but so important that we realize that this is not an education issue and it's not a, just an education issue. It's not just a women issue. It's a profession issue. Mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Um, Corbin Simon, you said that, um, some older ODs, and I'm assuming that this is perhaps male and female are are less inclined to negotiate is when you are working with with people who have asked to work with a consultant is is negotiation part of your your coaching negotiating with whom? well well i guess uh, that's that's actually a, a very good question right because you have to negotiate in in so many places you're negotiating even as an owner you're negotiating for for leases you're negotiating right. with employees you're negotiating for products right. um but you know if if you're and and all of those things chip away right if you're giving right. away a little here and giving away a little there it's going to affect your your compensation so you know, is, is that part of the, 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 the conversation, advocating for yourself? Well, I think the conversation is, one, you have to look at it by state. Um, when we look at numbers and we look to see, you know, OD salaries in a state, because it's going to vary from New Jersey, someone who's in New Jersey versus someone who's in Indiana, that becomes a factor. So when we're talking about doctors bringing on associates in their practices, okay, we're negotiating what's going to be, how that doctor's going to fit your culture, right? How that doctor's going to fit your culture, whether or not that doctor's going to bring value to your practice, can that doctor add a skill? So with all those different layers, then you have to determine for that state, what is that worth, okay? And how much is it worth you? Is it worth to you enough to pay this person and then take a step back from your practice so you can enjoy, a, you know, a better quality of life with your family? So all of those, um, all of those things have to be considered, you know, when we're talking about someone who's negotiating um, with a, another associate. But on the other end of that, you know, that associate OD who's coming on also have to talk about what they're worth. You know, not that they're just coming into a practice and someone says, here's a, here's a number I'm going to start you with, and that's what they're going to take. They also have to sell themselves in terms of what they're worth, their skill set, you know, and bring that to the practice and what value that can add to the practice as well. Great. Yeah. Um, Dr. Russo, it, obviously surveys and, and um like this, compensation surveys don't necessarily tell the whole story. As Dr. Corbin Simon said, you know, there's there's going to be regional variations, um, things like that. But it's it's an uncomfortable topic, isn't it? I mean, people want to think that they've done okay for themselves. You know, this I, I must be doing all right. And and how how did you kind of feel about diving into this? 
Uh, it's a good question because I, th I think uh, sometimes there's a little bit of soul searching that we have to do in, in thinking about, and certainly I don't want to speak for other people, but for myself, um, you know, in thinking about wanting to be and wanting to investigate this issue and to some extent be a champion um, for this issue, I also had to look inward and think uh, about my experiences and times when I was being underpaid and you know, times when I went into a negotiation having not done my homework and being told this is what you're going to get paid and it's not subject to negotiation and thinking, okay, well, that was similar to what I was getting paid at my previous job, so it's probably okay. So uh, it's, you do have to do that soul searching and sort of come to terms with your own mistakes or my own mistakes um, and, and learn from those. But I think it's important to move the conversation forward. I, you know, I can't just continue to put the blinders on and uh, pretend that I was getting paid fairly always um, and to try and make progress, right? We always have to be pushing forward. And so like Dr. Lyons mentioned in um, discussing negotiations and salary with mentees. You know, we talk about numbers. And if you're not talking about numbers, you're leaving out a critical piece to the mentor-mentee relationship. And so even though it can be somewhat um, awkward at times because it hasn't, it doesn't happen as commonly as it probably should, I think there's something to be said about that in normalizing these discussions so that we can be um, very candid with um, colleagues and mentors and, and really advocate for ourselves when it comes time to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lyons, would transparency help? I think transparency is an important thing. I think transparency is, um, would help help the profession in understanding where we are in understanding negotiation better. And part of that is just as um, has been mentioned, doing your homework and, and how to do your homework and how to, if there was more transparency, the, the importance of, you know, compensation analysis within practices is something that we could look at. Um, and if there was, you know, it's always been taboo to talk about, you know, income, you know, talk about what do you make and that's always been quite taboo. But if, if practices were doing proper compensation analysis and um, looking at their staff and be rewarding their staff accordingly, uh, not on the basis of gender, then that would be very helpful. Dr. Corbin Simon, do you see sort of a, a, a management difference between those owners who want to keep their financials to themselves and those who are willing to be more transparent? I mean, is there a, a benefit? Oh, definitely. Um, one of the things we, we try to do is encourage our doctors to actually open up their books to their staff members, you know, help them to understand, you know, what actually is going on in the practice, how money comes in, how money flows out, and, you know, how they're going to benefit by knowing that, you know, how they're going to benefit by knowing the cost of good, you know, what those percentages mean, mm -hmm. um, and how the pr practice can continue to grow. You get a lot of pushback from doctors, you know, wanting to expose themselves that way. Um, because they feel um, as though, okay, if I do this now, then they're going to know what I make, but they don't have to know what you make, right? But helping them to understand, helping your doctors to understand, your associate doctors to understand, here's how the practice is doing, and, you know, is, is, is it viable, uh, a business? And then, you know, how we can build it forward and what steps can you take, you know, that associate doctor can take to help grow that business right? And then help, help them to grow themselves as well, too, in terms of financial growth, right? And I think a lot of doctors don't make that connection. And if they open up their books to their, um, to their employees, that is going to make a difference in how the employee views the business. I mean, that's something that I do in my office. And it strengthens us because, you know, staff members are, oh, we can't purchase that this month because it's not in our budget, right? So it makes a huge difference. Um, and I think that will help in terms of, especially if you're talking about female compensation, 
help them to understand too, okay, well, here's what I'm bringing into the, val the practice. Here's the value that I have. Here's the, here's the um, amount of revenue that I'm generating, okay? How can that benefit me in terms of now my income actually increasing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Russo, in, in terms of schools, you, you know, and what, um, what their role is, because as, as Dr. Lyons mentioned, the, the AMA report, I mean, that, that looks at, uh, um, that looks at organizational um, issues, it looks at uh, schools, it looks at mentoring, it looks at, at sort of industry-wide transparency, you know, where where do you see, and obviously you're not speaking for, for all schools, but you know, <laughs> Why is this important to you? I, uh, it's a great question. I think why it's important to me and similarly why it is and should be important to schools is um, they're inextricably linked because I am an educator. Um, you know, we're not just responsible for preparing our students to be caring and competent doctors, right? That is the number one thing. We want them to care for patients <laughs> competently and in a compassionate and empathetic way. But we're also preparing them to go out into the workforce. Um, and you know that's a, a, a common source of maybe friction uh, between, from a curriculum standpoint, how much time we spend on you know content, uh, clinical content versus business. And of course, there's a, a sliver of the curriculum that deals with business. But uh, I do think that we should probably be challenging ourselves from a curriculum standpoint to carve out a bit more time to be preparing our students to um, to go out into the workforce. And and one of the reasons that I really um, appreciate that statement from the AMA is that it, it includes a, a piece that addresses schools and, and educational institutions to include training on leadership, to discuss negotiations and contracts, and then also career advancement. And so uh, that's important. You know, I teach a, a leadership elective at NECO, and uh, it's a small course, but hopefully we'll build on it, but it covers a lot of those principles and it's a starting off point. And so the students that um, have been in my class, interestingly, the first group of students that took the, the, co the course were all female. Um, we have had very candid discussions about, I'm going to be interviewing for a job. What are the questions I should ask? How do I demonstrate my value to the practice? I'm a new grad. You know, I don't have the same clinical experience as someone that's been out five, 10 years, but that's when we'll talk about intangibles and we talk about certain personality traits. How conscientious are you? How um, open to flexibility? Uh, there, there are different aspects that you can um, discuss and demonstrate your value in that way as a new grad, even if you don't have the clinical years of experience, there are other aspects to you that can be valuable uh, and extremely valuable to uh, a certain uh, to a practice. Right. Dr. Lyons, uh, back when Women in Optometry started the uh, Thea Awards five years ago, you were our first uh, educator to, to receive this, and you, you came with a whole cheering section. I know that you've made uh, an uh, honor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that you've made a huge impact on the, the students that you've, you've taught over the years. And you know, obviously you want to see these people go out and, and do well. They're your kids. <laughs> and, and so why is this important sort of from, from a mentoring standpoint that, you know, there's, there's fair compensation? Uh, from, from a mentoring that there's fair compensation is because they have the exact same education as their male counterparts. And it's so imperative that they are compensated accordingly, that it's not different. Um, that, that's number one. Um, and as Diane talked about, you know, not only making a, a student a caring and competent clinician, but the importance that we uh, look at um, the skills and prepare them for entering the profession, as well as the importance of career advancement. Um, not only from the time they enter the profession, but throughout their entire career. It's not unusual that I get calls from many alumni who are 
calling me after five or 10 years looking for, for additional mentoring and as their careers making changes or continuing and you know what is next and i think that um, it's important that men and women are both treated equally as they have the same education the same degree and the same expertise and dr corbin simon I, I, not to be mercenary about it but of course you know if, if everybody uh, asked for the same level of pay, you know, and and there are discrepancies in pay. I mean, how that's hard for a business owner, right? You want to get if you're sitting across the table from somebody who is not negotiating for a higher wage, you know, is is there a part of that doctor saying mm, you really could push this? You know, I mean, how how do you how do you balance that? I don't, know if, I don't know if you need to push it, um, but definitely, you know, I think part of these packages too can be incentives, okay? Um, okay, so let's say if we reassess you after a certain period of time and give you a number to say, okay, um, let's make sure that you're bringing this amount of revenue into a practice and you're reach, reaching those goals, then there's no reason why you shouldn't get a percentage of that, right? Um, and I think that's how part of that negotiation can take place. So yes, if a practice owner feels, you know what, I'm gonna be on the edge if I bring this person in at a, you know, a higher salary rate. But what we can do is see, let's see if you're worth it. Let's see if, yeah, all the, all the things that you're putting on the table that says that you're worth what uh, you know, um, you're asking for, then let's put it out there in the percentage of what comes into the practice. And if, if, if that's working out great, I think that's how, they, that's how people can move forward. Um, I think what has to happen, I see that in negotiation with men, um, putting it out there, okay, let's, um, let's reassess me and reevaluate me after a period of time. I don't see that necessarily with women mm -hmm. that happen in. It's always something that I put on the table, um, but we don't talk about it enough to say, okay, you can bring this into the practice, okay, we can see what your revenue is as you, as you bring more into practice. And then we can say you can earn a percentage of that. That doesn't happen as often with women as it does with men in those conversations. So I, th I think that's part of that goalpost that we need to move a little bit um, forward in helping women to understand you can, you can have more at the table, okay, mm -hmm. in these conversations. So talking about it is a, a, is a starting point. I think we'd, we'd all agree. Um, is it enough, Dr. Corbin Simon? Um, is it enough? I, I think we also have to recognize on the male end of things as well too. I, I think part of what happens too is that um, probably from a male perspective, it's always looked upon, well, you know, we're probably gonna drop out as females. You know, we're gonna have a family, we won't be there anymore in the practice. And so I, I think that's where the issue lies, that we're not going to be trying, driving this forward anymore, so there's no reason for further compensation. I think that needs to change, and, and it needs to change in terms of understanding the dynamic that if you have a great doctor, that doctor is going to produce for you, okay? And as that doctor produces for you, you have to compensate in that way as well, but not base it on if a male comes into my practice, the male is going to stay, Okay, because there's going to be no obstacles to whether or not he's going to come to work. Right. So I think that's part of what we're dealing with. Um, and, and we need to change that dynamic. Right. Whether that's supported by fact or not. <laughs> uh, Dr. Lyons is is talking about this enough. No, not at all. I think that we as a profession absolutely develop a plan and look at solutions within the entire profession when we have the opportunity to do it and it's time to start. Dr. Russo? Yeah, so uh, definitely not. It's not enough to just talk about it. I mean, raising awareness is uh, an important part, but if you just talk about the issue and not actually actions that you can take to address it, then and everything, any progress just halts. And I know Dr. Lyons and I have talked about, you know, one 
very concrete, actionable thing that um, practices and practice owners can be doing is looking inward. Let's get our own house in order. Let's do a compensation analysis and see what our books look like. Are we paying people fairly or are we allowing uh, blatant gender pay gaps to exist and just sort of saying, well, so-and-so didn't negotiate hard, hard enough that's the way the cookie crumbles. You know, I think we can do better than that. And, and additionally, I think looking inward to address implicit and explicit biases and how um, practice owners approach negotiating from their side of the table. And like I, I think Dr. Lyons mentioned before, this isn't just a female OD problem. Uh, this is a profession-wide problem. And I think we all need to contribute to solutions so that we can mitigate and eventually eliminate any pay gap that exists. It's a tall order. It's been around for a long time. There's no silver bullet, but um, you know, I think that the more that we do raise awareness, not just talk about it, but raise awareness uh, and 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 recognize it. I mean, I, I think unfortunately, it seems easy to have that knee jerk reaction. And Dr. Lyons, you and I have talked about this. Uh, that's a general number. It's not the way things happen in my little part of the universe, but survey after survey after survey across professions has shown that this gap does exist. Um, even when you, even when you balance for full-time work and to full-time work and years out of, pra out of school and, and things like that, it, it just, uh, I mean, there, there are slivers of hope um, with the, you know, with the younger ODs coming in, perhaps being more aggressive, perhaps being, um, um, hungrier <laughs> but um, it, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting and compelling issue I want to thank you all so much for being part of this conversation thank you thank you, you. Having us. Mm -hmm.